you're back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escow. Uh, this week, uh, this past week, Henry Kissinger died, and uh, we are fortunate to have with us two people who were alive and aware during Kissinger's year, years of greatest power. I'm speaking of myself and my guest uh, and friend, Richard Wolf who we always enjoy speaking with on this program. And since uh, Mr. Kissinger's death is nothing if not uh, the marking of uh, a passing of the torch to a new generation of whatever you want to call them, uh, uh, global hegemonists or something else, uh, we thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, the legacy of Henry Kissinger. So without any further ado, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Thank you, RJ. Glad to be here. So, so Henry Kissinger, you and I remember uh, when controversy over the war in Vietnam caused Lyndon Johnson to uh, nearly lose the New Hampshire primary uh, in the 1968 presidential election, decide that he could not run for a second term. Long story short, we wind up with Richard Nixon. We wind up with Henry Kissinger, who had been around DC in the kind of think tank world for a while, even though he was still, I think, barely pushing 40 if that. Uh, some people say he was the prototype for Dr. Strangelove in, uh, in the movie of the same name. I don't know about that, uh, but they say it in seriousness. Uh, so Kissinger uh, quickly became the most powerful person in the government. And I do think it's fair to say that uh, for good, good or ill, and I would argue ill, uh, that his presence on the world stage changes the change the trajectory of history is first of all do you think that's a fair statement yes i think it's fair in the sense that it's ever fair to say that in my own opinion it is grandiosity in the minds of people carried along by history to imagine that they're not being carried along but that they are doing the carrying Maybe that's a human failing in many of us. I don't know. But if you take a step back, I think you'll find it's more likely that the great men were carried than they did much carrying themselves. Um, you know, it's easy to become a legend in your own mind. And and I think a lot of, a lot of us are prone to that and perhaps see it in others. And just to say, just to interrupt for a second, just to be clear, uh, I don't think that the forces that Henry Kissinger, I'm not a fan of the great man theory of history or great person as it would be now. Uh, I'm more of a fan of the great movement theory of history. We could talk about that a little too. But, but I do think that different individuals are more effective and have an impact in the way trends affect the world. I mean, I would say that Germany was in trouble uh in the after world war one years of the weimar republic hitler you know may i would argue probably took it to more extremes than another figure might have and similarly the u.s was going to do was already doing much of the what henry kissinger was doing but i might argue that kissinger uh was more effective in doing those things or 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 certainly more aggressive in doing those things. I, I don't know if you agree with that, but that I would just modify my a great man, seeming great man statement to that extent. For me, yeah, I, I agree with you. For, for me, looking at Kissinger's life means locating it, to use your language, within the movements of his time that he adapted himself to, um, it goes with uh, the position of being a foreign policy specialist, of being a professor at Harvard, which gives you uh, systematically uh, delusions of grandeur uh, and, and your role in history, since the institution pretends that it functions in America uh, in that way as a major trendsetter and all the And I say this. Uh, I went to Harvard uh, myself, 
Um, and I listened in to Kissinger's lectures when I was there. Um, so I can tell you the room was filled with, with all of this. He rarely missed an opportunity to make remarks to make sure you understood of the very powerful people that he was in some way associated with. It was downright embarrassing. Um, it reminded me of, of another, uh, reading the notice of his death, it reminded me of another moment because my family is French. When there are family events to celebrate, uh, my father and mother would take us to a French restaurant where we could eat French cuisine. New York City, which is where they took us, uh, has some of those. And one of the best known for many, many years was called La Grenouille, which is a French word for frog. Um, and I remember there going there once. I was an adult at that point and bringing my own family as well. And when you entered the restaurant and the Metro D welcomed you and escorted you to your table, right in the, in the front, in a table you could not miss looking at because you had to walk on one or the other side of it to get to any other table in the restaurant. It was a table planted there for no other purpose than to put whoever sat there on display. And since, you know, I'm familiar with the picture, as we entered, there was sitting Henry Kissinger and a very old-looking face that I knew I had seen somewhere uh, and that my wife explained to me belonged to the actor Kirk Douglas. Uh, and the two of them were having lunch. And since my wife is more, how shall I say, outspoken about such things than I am, she called the waiter over and said, wow, you know, it's bad enough that, that these kinds of people have the power they do, but why do we have to look at them for lunch at your restaurant? And the waiter smiled and said, we try everything to give them a table in a quiet corner so that they aren't in front like that, but they won't have it, and they insist on that table. Well, well I think it tells you a lot about, uh, I, I don't know, Kirk Douglas uh, from A Hole in the Wall, but it tells you a lot about uh, Henry Kissinger. I'm struck also because the New York Times today carried a piece by another foreign policy uh, activist in the United States, a man named Ben Rhodes. And uh, um, his piece for Kissinger is entitled Henry Kissinger, the Hypocrite. That, that's the title. And the article kind of oscillates back and forth. Uh, giving Kissinger some uh, praise and some credit for some things that happened, uh, but also making sure to list the things he bears responsibility for that didn't work out well, that are hideous and ugly uh, and murderous in some cases. So for those people who don't want, you know, just a celebration uh you know, if you don't, if you can't say something good, don't say anything. No, Ben Rhodes does better than that. But I, he also makes a mistake, which I would like just to comment on. I don't think what Henry Kissinger did is hypocrisy. In other words, the gap, as Mr. Rhodes puts it in his piece, the gap between Americans' a story that they like to tell about themselves and the reality of what the American government has been doing does not mean that if you claim to support both of them, but you only do one of them, you're a hypocrite. It's clear that he means that Kissinger was a power politician for whom the stories about America supporting democracy or being the friend of the underdog or wanting to spread democracy was, you know, secondary noise at best. Yeah, it's clear. Uh, Kissinger even said those things in class at Harvard. 
But it doesn't make him a hypocrite, not in my judgment. I think he understood, maybe he didn't have enough respect for it. That's probably a case you could make, that he didn't respect the importance of ideological cover and felt that just hard-knuckled power politics is so much the reality that we really don't need to waste a lot of time on the make-believe that goes with it. I don't think that's deep enough. I think that's really superficial. I think Mr. Kissinger was an important figure at an important inflection point in the United States. And without, you know, having the time to go into it, I would argue that the time of Mr. Kissinger's dominance, Nixon and all of that, was a time when the United States finally understood not only that it had inherited the empire that the British could no longer afford, but that, to their chagrin, the world wasn't eager to embrace the American military power that the American empire required, and that the country was stuck unable to move forward because it required ugly power politics, given the way the world was divided then, the role of a returning Europe and Japan coming back after the destruction of World War II, the growing power of Russia and China as a kind of alternative, and the emergence at the end of colonialism, of that whole part of the world that had been repressed and suppressed uh, as colonies. This put the United States in a whole new position, and it was very difficult, and it tried its best in the last quarter of the 20th century to manage this. It tried to use its old self-story celebration of democracy, that didn't work real well. Nobody really believed it. It tried power politics. That was really the truth of what it had to offer, the most powerful military, the biggest economy, and all that went with that. But even that was being challenged bit by bit as much by Europe and Japan as by Russia and China. Europe and Japan were the bigger challenges then. Russia and China have become the bigger challenges now. And Mr. Kissinger was whipped back and forth. And so he made a decision. Forget the noise. Forget the ideological stuff. Say it when you need to. But don't say it with too much conviction. It isn't true. We all know it isn't true. It really is a lot of noise. Adults in the room should know that and see beyond it. Let's get down to the real story. Do this or we'll bomb you back into the Stone Age. Okay. Uh, um, we'll kill you, as with Allende in Chile. We will undo you. We will foment revolution. We will buy your elections long before you can figure out how to do that with us, etc., etc. This was an ugly politician, not because he was not much to look at or to think about in terms of beauty, but because the times called for it. You mm. could not go back to the self-congratulatory story of the United States emerging out of the old British Empire. That story was done by the time of the Civil War, and Mr. Kissinger came way too late for all of that. The United States had joined the struggle for who would be the dominant empire, and at the end of World War I emerged as exactly that, the dominant empire. He couldn't go back to the old story. And because he didn't respect ideological noise, veneers, uh, window dressing, he didn't give it much thought, and he wasn't particularly good at it. He wanted to get to how does this new little empire save itself? What are its strengths, and how do you use them? And it thought that would be enough. Ben Rhodes is right. It's never enough. It wasn't enough 
ever before, and it's not enough now. But Mr. Kissinger didn't make the decision. It was the position of the United States that made its old ideological story something that the world had little use for, did not believe. For a long time, it was only the Americans who believed it. And now the problem is for the next generation that now not only does the, not, the rest of the world not believe it, but Americans are not believing it in the numbers they used to anymore either. That's why we can't have another Kissinger. The times aren't right. The man doesn't make the history. That history made that man. I would agree with everything you said, but I, I want to just kind of, first of all, tie off a few uh, arteries there before we right. you know, close the patient and uh, just revisit them a little bit and then maybe uh, uh, bring up a couple of things. One is in terms of, I haven't read the Ben Rhodes piece, Ben Rhodes, young, youngish guy, you know, part of the uh, Obama contingent. Uh, but I haven't read this piece, but I do know that when someone, uh, that there is a sort of patrolling the leftmost perimeter of the discourse. You can go this, just so far left and no much, and no further. And it seems that in certain mainstream circles, as far left as you can go is to say, we are sometimes hypocritical in our foreign policy, or uh, in a phrase that uh, Mr. Obama himself has used, perhaps written by Ben Rhodes for all I know, that we have failed in certain circumstances to live up to our ideals. Uh, we hear this time and time again, and then we see a complete, you know, ignoring of internet, you know, our Secretary of State and Mr. Blinken gave a stirring speech uh, last year about uh, international law and international institutions, which we ignore and traduce right and left. That's not a case any more than it is with Kissinger of failing to live up to our ideals. It's, as you said, I think the lip service to, to pacify the people here at home who are beginning to see through it. But a couple other thoughts. One is, uh, I think Kissinger's concept of, you know, what he called real politic, uh, of a hard nose, was, uh, you know, uh, it was it, not actually any more hard nosed. I, you know, I'm a tough guy, I just take things as they are, and no sentimentality. It actually was no more effective than if you think of it in terms of the stated objectives of, for example, the policy in Vietnam, utter failure, horrendous humanitarian disaster, but also military disaster. Everything Kissinger touched militarily was not only a war crime, but a failure. So, so this notion of real politic, it seemed to me that was for the, the, the insiders in Washington, the elites, the Democrats, Perhaps in particular, were tough guys. Were, were you know since since it was all male leadership in those days. We're we we're men. We're tough men. You know we we take the tough decisions. I think that that appealed to a lot of people. I think my proudest moment working for Bernie Sanders was in his debate with Hillary Clinton when she said, "I talk to my friends like Henry Kissinger about follow." foreign policy. I don't know who he talks to. And he said, well, it ain't Henry Kissinger. I'll tell you that. Uh, I was proud of that. But but there was another dimension of it, interestingly enough, that I thought of when we were talking, which is I had a friend in my college-ish days, so we would be talking about mid-1970s, who had been part of some Latin American revolutionary movements and, and uh, some left-wing Latin American governments. And she said, you know, for the left, I was talking about how much I uh, despise Kissinger and so on. And, and she said, well, you know, we in Latin America would rather deal with a Henry Kissinger than, you know, the Democratic equivalent, whoever it might have been at the time, Cyrus Vance or whomever, uh, because she said, he's going to tell you. You know, we we could say to a Democrat, you know, this is how we plan to do things. We're going to nationalize these industries. The Democrats are going to say, well, you know, it's your country, but we, you know, we're concerned. Then they'll overthrow your government and kill your leader. The difference with Kissinger is if you tell Kissinger that, he says, well, if you do, if you try to do that, I'll, I'll kill you. And they say, you know, we found that easier to deal with. So I thought that was an interesting take. Um, 
And I have one other personal anecdote about Henry Kissinger, which if you bear with me, I will tell, because I thought it was in its own way illustrative. So I, I used to work for AIG, American International Group, and Henry Kissinger was on the board of AIG, and it wasn't because of his uh, knowledge of world affairs, obviously, it was his connections. And I went to India as a, uh, on a project for the Harvard School of International Public Health, but I was also invited to meet with the Indian, the head of the Indian Commission of Insurance Companies. Now, if you know India's situation then, these were all publicly owned, they had nationalized insurance companies, foreign companies could not write insurance in India, they could not hold risk. So my AIG handlers said, Richard, uh, ask them if we could at least provide some sort of consulting services or software or something for them. This would have been about 1989. I, okay, so I did that. Uh, they said the, the head of the commission, who was quite a character, former Bollywood actor, I, that's a whole other story. He said, yeah, maybe you could even take a little tiny bit of risk, something like that. So when I got home two weeks later, I wrote up my reports, sent it in, thought nothing else about it. Two months later, I got a call from Henry Kissinger's personal assistant. And uh, he said, Mr. Kissinger would like to know exactly, word for word, what the commissioner of insurance said to you about bearing risk. And I said, you know, I don't remember word for word, but it was to the gist of, you know, what I just told you. He said, no, no, no. Mr. Kissinger wants it word for word. And I said, yeah, it was two months ago. What do you mean? You know, what do you expect? Word for, you know, I can't give you word for word. And he said, you're not hearing me. Mr. Kissinger wants you to tell me that this is what he said word for word. Now think about that for a second. I said, okay, this is what he said word for word. Like I got it. He wanted me to say anything and just, uh, attest that it was word for word so that Henry Kissinger could then go to the board of AIG and the State Department and as Secretary of State, whoever else he wanted to go to, and say, your commissioner of insurance said, and I quote. In other words, he didn't give a damn about what the actual truth was. He just wanted to make sure uh, it was packaged and tied with a bow as if it were the the precise truth. Do you get what I'm trying to drive yes, at there? Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm used to that in academic administrations that I have worked on with all my life, that every every administrator understands, or they're not in the job very long, that they have to cover their rear end, and they have to make sure that any decision they make, if it turns out to be wrong, which of course it can, that they have a fallback that they can blame someone else because that's the best chance they have of surviving having made a mistake. I learned that as an economist early on. You get called in, especially if you've been to the fancy universities as I have, and so you have the credentials, and you come in and, and you're asked to write a report, you know, should this company expand in Asia? Or should we draw, try to produce these kinds of commodities? And you do a study. You are extremely well paid. And the vice president who hires you makes sure you understand right away what it is you are going to find. You can't be offended by that. Otherwise, you will not be brought back ever again. You are to write a report that gets the results that you've been asked to write a report for. Why? Well, it turns out, it, it took me a while to learn, the executive in question has already made the decision. All that he is doing, because it's mostly he and very rarely she that I ever dealt with, all he's doing is making sure that in the event the decision he made goes south, is a disaster, loses money or whatever else, he can say, no, 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 don't fire me. I took the advice of the best collection of experts. That's his best chance. He may not survive either, 
but that's his best chance, and he's in much better shape to survive with such a bullshit report than if he didn't go to the time and trouble of spending the company's money to commission such a bullshit report. And there are people who make a lot more money than being a professor by using their time to write those reports. And if they do it at all well, they will eventually become an administrative bureaucrat themselves and they'll know exactly what to do because they've been trained in doing that for the previous 30 years i mean it's it, it's it's an unmistakable uh reality mr kissinger one last uh, uh one last thing uh, to say he was also a kind of genius in that way when the war in vietnam was totally and completely lost by the United States, when the whole world was treated to those video and photographs of the desperate uh, clientele of the United States trying to hold on to the helicopter uh, tracks at the bottom as, the, as they lifted off from Saigon's airport for the last time. You know, he went on giving speeches, making believe this was all either a success or somebody else's fault and which way he went depended on his audience and his mood at the time that he gave the speech he was an articulate manipulator all the time and you know people should understand that that didn't work that well for him those wars were lost those alliances were fractured Chile today, as Ben Rhodes points out, has a socialist uh, uh, leader and a, a, a granddaughter, I believe, of Allende is a minister in the cabinet. You know, it didn't work. It didn't solve the problem. It didn't shape the history any other ways he said it would. But he was giving the, the BS that was appropriate to a tough time in the United States, the results of which behaving hardball at a time when you're losing your empire that didn't turn out to be such a genius stroke at all well and and the one maybe as a closing note the one thing we're going to hear over and over it was his accomplishment is uh the opening to china right. and uh to me that brings us full circle to the beginning of the conversation when you were mentioning the times and the moment and uh you know seeing the beginning at the end of of that era of u.s hegemony it seems to me that it's interesting that it happened then uh but that at least that appears to have been the result of an understanding that the u.s was not going to make it alone and that uh China represented an alternative, a way to kind of triangulate maybe against the USSR or new markets or something else. But there was a logic in doing that. There was a calculation in doing that that uh, did not jive. You know, everybody was bored. Only Nixon could have gone to China because he was such a staunch anti-communist. I have a feeling it didn't have anything to do with communists versus anti-communists. It had to do with, hey, we need new markets, we need new labor sources, we're going to need this and that, and we better get in there fast before somebody else does. Do you think that's more or less on the right track? Yeah, no, it's perfectly in line with what I think was going on. And I think one of the things that I would say attracts people like me to a character like him uh, at least for observation purposes, is I think he understood that the anti-communism was an empty nonsense for him. It was ideological noise, convenient to use. It seemed to get people to agree with you a bit more quickly than they might otherwise have. So he went around babbling that stuff, but he did it knowing that what he was really doing was playing large power politics. And if that changed, he would have a different attitude. The communism, just a convenient way to beat up on certain groups and 
bring into alliance other groups, and that's what he was interested in doing. And if the logic of anti-communism doesn't help you, well, then why don't you try a new one? Let's call it, oh, I don't know, anti-authoritarianism. That's the, that's the BS equivalent today, and the students of Kissinger are using that language, which, by the way, is even vaguer than whatever anti-communist was supposed to mean at a time, by the way, in which every one of the communist countries this was used about never referred to themselves as communists. They always referred to themselves as a people's republic or a people's democratic republic or as socialists. To this day, none of those countries, those that are left, they do not refer to themselves. It was a choice of a language that would help the power politics had nothing to do with taking the ideas seriously. And so I guess in closing, uh, if I had to pick one word uh, to characterize Henry Kissinger, I would probably say power, uh, how to get it, how to use it, how to maintain it. Uh, against all odds. I mean, I know it's highly reductionist to reduce a person to one word, but everything he did, he was, as you say, fascinating in his, uh, as a case study and uh, and all those things. Do you have a single word you would summarize them with? Yeah, for me, he was a creature of the American moment. This peculiar, <laughs> short, historical situation where a wannabe empire picks up the pieces from the collapsed British empire, sees it has no competitors, jumps with excitement into what John Mearsheimer calls the unipolar moment uh, uh, towards the last part of the 20th century, already seeing in the handwriting on the wall where its vulnerabilities lie, where its gaps lie, and trying to come in as best he can with whatever tools he's given to try to hold on to that moment a, a few months or years beyond no matter what price you pay. Because for him, the human price of all of this was as vague and inconsequential as the stories we tell about why we do what we do. It's all about the power, getting it, holding it, and staving off the change that always ends the powerful's period of power. Interesting. So we'll have to leave it at, at that. Uh, Henry Kissinger will not die again, so I'm not sure we'll have the opportunity to talk about it him at this length again about Richard Wolff. As always, uh, a pleasure. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you, RJ. Glad to do it and glad to have a chance to talk about someone who, who played a role in the lives we've all led over the last 40 or 50 years of this country's history. I hate to tell you, it's even more. Uh, and we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.